Buenos dias, thank you so much, Francesca, for this fantastic introduction into the second day of the Thyssen Bornemisza Symposium. Before I delve into the past, and given my biblical age, it's the deep past, but before I do that, I would like to say how incredibly impressive it is to witness here in Madrid the realization of the vision of Baron Thyssen and to see what has happened of his dream and of his vision. And yesterday, going through the gallery, going through the new wing that is uh, um, prepared, going through the phenomenal uh, Magritte exhibition, which is one of the best Magritte exhibitions I've ever seen anywhere, it was really exciting. Uh, this morning when I came here, when I saw the queue uh, waiting to get in, I thought this is everything uh, Baron Thyssen was dreaming of uh, way back. So uh, it really, fills me with joy to see that. And now I will go uh, uh, back, back to the future or back to the distant past. But I, uh, as Francesca said, it's a little bit like a class reunion because I had the pleasure of seeing people I haven't seen for many, many, many years, notably Marco and Cristina Grassi. And I must say Marco's uh, speech yesterday was the one that I enjoyed most maybe because it was just very personal and, and uh, indeed it is really highlights the extraordinary personality uh, of Baron Thyssen and uh, everybody who has had uh, contact with him and had uh, dealings with him has felt this uh, very strongly. Now, I must apologize, uh, e even Marco's uh, presentation was with lots of visual materials, so we had, and yesterday we had high tech, we had speakers speaking from all over the place. Uh, this is definitely a no tech uh, presentation. I don't have even a single slide to show you, so I apologize for this in advance. Now, uh, how did I meet Baron Thyssen? Um, my dream was to become an artist initially, and I was such a failure as an artist that uh, I then felt that the next second thing is to become an art dealer. And so well, at least you surround yourself with uh, the art of people that you admire. And uh, so I did a, a course at Sotheby's in um, London, and then I, this was at the moment of very a high inflation, a very difficult moment for the art market and for the economy in general. Uh, the year that I was doing the Sazabi Works of Art course, uh, they made something like 60 people redundant in the company, which was, uh, so I said, how am I going to get a job if they make so many people redundant? So at the end of the course, they still had not offered me a job, and I said, I'm not going to leave uh, until they offer me a job. Anyway, so they did offer me a job, I think purely because my, uh, French is my mother tongue, and so I had to translate the catalogs of the first sales that Sotheby's was doing in Monaco. This meant that they sent me to Monaco, and uh, the sales in Monaco were happening because there was a Napoleonic law which prevented big auctions to take place in Paris. So uh, the commissaire priseurs was the only people allowed to do auctions. So Peter Wilson, who was mentioned in Edmund Peel's speech yesterday, who was also a great visionary like uh, Baron Thyssen, uh, decided to circumvent this uh, law by going to Monaco. And so in the mid-1970s, one spectacular auction took place after the other in Monte Carlo, in the beautiful Art Deco rooms of the Sporting d'Hiver. Th those were the days when the big collectors would not hide behind a phone, co a phone or in a box. They were not only hiding, they were very much there. They were there physically. Uh, these sales were evening sales. They were starting at 10 p.m. We could think we were in Spain, but it was in Monaco. And you had to be dressed up, not just the staff uh, who was in, in black tie, but all the guests were in black tie, and there were uh, things with champagne buckets, and so you were sitting there, and uh, all these friends were bidding and having a good time while they were bidding. And so that's when I met for the first time Baron Thyssen, and I saw, my God, this is such an amazing uh, silhouette. This is the, the best-looking man I've ever seen, the most elegant man I've ever seen, and uh, just the way he moved was fascinating. Another person that equally fascinated me was 
because Gianni Agnelli, uh, uh, for, he, for me, he looked like a fauve. Uh, I was observing his hands. I mean, uh, absolutely extraordinary figures. You mentioned uh, Stavros Niarchos. He was, he was there. There was Charles Claw, uh, you know, who uh, founded the Claw Gallery for Tate uh, Britain. Uh, there was uh, all these kind of high net worth individuals of the days, and there were far many then than there are today, were physically there. And so, um, Baron Thyssen being an important uh, client, I was told you really we have to take extra good care of him and all of that. And so, uh, he was a very active buyer that we figured out by now. So, after the auctions, I had to make sure that all the invoicing, all the packaging, or everything was done really like clockwork, and I'm not a very organized person, but somehow I managed to give the impression that I was. So uh, then uh, Baron Thyssen was coming to these sales, we, uh, accompanied by, uh, when, when it was about buying decorative works of art, uh, there was a, a Greek antique dealer called Peter Zevudaki, and Peter Zevudaki uh, was helpful in uh, locating some items that Baron Thyssen bought, but also he helped people like Gianni Agnelli, like Niakos, and, and some of the uh, big collectors of the time. And uh, fast forward six months later, uh, meanwhile, being Swiss, Sazabes uh, sent me to Geneva and asked me to open the Geneva office of Sazabes. And quite early on, suddenly unannounced, uh, walk into my office, uh, Baron Thyssen, accompanied by Peter Zevudaki and by François Dolt. François Dolt was also mentioned yesterday. Uh, he was a great expert on Impressionism. Uh, he wrote the catalogue raisonnés of Renoir and of Sisley, and he was also organizing big exhibitions in Japan. And I thought, oh, that's you know, it's surprising that they all come, and, and so they, I asked, would you like some tea? And I uh, said, yes, we'd like some tea, and so they sat there, and, uh, and I kept wondering, why are they here? Will they, uh, they will surely broach the subject at some stage, why they are here? And not at all, we, we, we had a small talk, chatting, and, uh, and then after 45 minutes, they very politely got up and left, and I still hadn't figured out why they had uh, why they had come. And then uh, I got a message half an hour later, would I be free for dinner? And I said, yes, of course, with, with great pleasure. And so we went to have dinner at the Hotel Richemont in Geneva, which was in those days the chicest hotel, and sadly is no longer quite as chic. And <laughs> uh, there was uh, Princess Ira Furstenberg was there, and uh, Baron Thyssen, and Peter Zebudaki, and myself. And again, the whole dinner, small talk, but really nice, and, and uh, the more I saw Baron Tissa, the more I thought, this is just an amazing person, because he had so much humor, uh, he was so warm, he was so, I would say, humble, because you, you can be intimidated if you see somebody who has a kind of a, uh, a larger-than-life reputation, and in the contrary, uh, I felt all these contacts, these direct contacts, I felt instantly at ease, and instantly I liked him very much, and I believe that all the people who spoke yesterday, that was a common denominator, even those who met him just once for an interview, all relayed that, that feeling, it, regardless um, whether you were, uh, you know, a, a big shot or just the gardener asking for something, he was absolutely incredibly courteous, warm, friendly, and the, the quality, one of the qualities I loved most in him, the sense of humor. You always had, you, you were laughing, you know, it was, everything became a pleasure. Anyway, that dinner was very pleasant. I still hadn't figured out why they invited me for dinner. But then the next morning, um, uh, Peter Zevudaki called me and said, listen, um, we just want you to, to know, are you married to Sotheby's? And um, so I said, well, listen, I love Sotheby's, and I, uh, my dream is to become an auctioneer, and this is all I ever dreamt of, etc. Anyway, to cut a long story short, they made me that offer to become curator at the um, Thies and Bonamisa collection in Lugano. Now, of course, this would be the chance of a lifetime for anybody, especially for the young 27-year-old man that I was back then. But I thought I better look who is the current curator, who is, who is it? And Marco Grassi, 
very aptly described who the curator there was. It was a wonderful gentleman called uh, Shandor Berkes, and as Marco Grassi said, he was uh, in charge of the stables of the horses in uh, uh, Schloss Rohonks in Hungary. And when the collection was then installed in Lugano, uh, he was the caretaker of the, of the collection. And so I got a little worried because Lugano was not known to be a place with a lot of life and action. And, I, and Mr. Berkes was a wonderful man. He was in his, he, I think he was exactly the age that I am now. And, uh, he, uh, and so I was asking him, you know, what does the job entail? So he explained to me, it's very simple, where the collection is open, only open on the weekend, and it's open from 10 to 5. So at quarter to 5, there is a little a, a gong here. You have to press the gong, and you have to say in the microphone, the gallery is closing. In in 15 minutes, please go towards the, the gate. And then said, that's interesting. And what else uh, do you have to do? And then uh, they said, well, the other thing is at night, uh, the alarm can go off. And if the alarm goes off, you have to run as fast as you can, and you have to come and check what is going on. Then I was more and more getting <laughs> worried, and I said, maybe, maybe this is not such an unbelievable chance of a lifetime. Maybe, maybe I'm going to bury myself alive. And uh, so, and while Lugano was stunningly beautiful, it also looked a little sleepy. So, anyhow. Um, so, in, with me, it was not a calculated strategy. Uh, uh, I remember the advice that uh, the father of Marco gave him, not to take it as a full-time job, but to make it a part-time job. So, with me, I, s I turned it down because I thought, I'm too young to bury myself alive. So, um, I, I, but as in your case, I think the fact that I said no initially did clearly help. I, I became desirable. So, um, I, and, and my mother said, no, you've got a good job, and you just got one baby, and you've got to, your responsibility is to look after the baby. You definitely don't take this job, because same thing as uh, verbatim what your father told you, when you work for a wealthy man, you know, you can suddenly be, be kicked off at a whim. Anyway, so having said no, eventually it turned into yes, and this is the, the, it really was the chance of my life, and I am eternally grateful to Baron Tissen for having given me uh, this chance, me being really, back then, a little greenhorn. And now, uh, the extraordinary thing about the collection was that, indeed, as we've heard by the first speaker, whose name I, uh, Mr. Gramlik, I think, Mr. Gramlik, yesterday morning, uh, who explained how it came that the uh, Villa Favorita was opened. But I would like to stress it was only opened on certain days days, this is on weekends, and only between Easter and mid-October. Uh, otherwise, it was completely closed. It was only people who asked to see the collection who would be shown the collection. So in a way, it was a sleeping beauty. And indeed, the first week, I thought, my God, I did the mistake of my life. <laughs> the alarm did go off at least twice during that week. <laughs> Three o'clock in the morning, I was running onto the roof and everywhere, seeing if anything terrible had happened. Um, I, you know, after having done the gong a few times, I thought, no, this is a little depressing. And then uh, Mr. Berkes, by the way, had not been told that he would be replaced. So he, he thought he still had the job. And so we both thought we had the job. And then the first week, we, we had to follow a painting that was lent to La Brera, and uh, I was sitting next to Mr. Berkes in his car, and we were, we were following the truck. The, the truck was going very, very slowly, and so we were going at um, uh, snail space, and eventually made it to La Brera, and then Mr. Berkes and he were, uh, me were overlooking how it was being unpacked. Now, fast forward, the absolutely phenomenal thing with Baron Tissen is that uh, the, w he, he, when you proposed something to him, and you always did it in, uh, normally you did it in writing, this is of course in pre-email, uh, pre-any of that, so there were these little memo sheets, there were light blue sheets, and you <laughs> wrote on it, or you typed on it, uh, your idea or your proposal. And uh, Baron Thyssen was traveling a lot, and, and when he was coming back on his desk, and I think we, we saw on the photograph, his desk was always 
piled with dossiers. So there was a gentleman uh, sending him, a, uh, preparing him a big dossier of all the business questions that he had to resolve, and I would preparing a big pile of stuff with all the questions relating to the collection. And uh, he would arrive, sometimes he would come back to Lugano late at night, but one thing was sure, at 7 a.m. Uh, he was razor blade sharp, focusing on everything, and he would go through these piles at the speed of light. And as I was telling to Susan Moore before, uh, he was uh, not writing comments or anything. It was either yes or no. Uh, it, was, no it, it was not yes, it was okay or no. And so one was looking to all these scribbles, and sometimes very, very depressing to see that something which one thought was an amazing idea, just uh, no. <laughs> and, but uh, when there was an okay, it was really an okay, and you could just go for it. He would not tell you how to do it, you go for it. And so I remember one day, I had seen the catalogues of the collection of Wadsden Manor. Uh, uh, and in the collection of Baron Thyssen, there was this wonderful uh, collection of gold boxes. And I had adored that catalog of gold boxes on the Wadsden Manor collection. So uh, one of my proposals was, why not do a catalogue raisonné uh, of all uh, um, things of the collection? And so I started looking for specialists in each area who could cover every possible field. And so some of the people we have seen uh, uh, yesterday uh, were part, uh, for instance, Mr. John Bolt was uh, Peter Virgo, uh, um, uh, the uh, um, Gaga, so the third gentleman who was also on the, on the um, screen yesterday also I had suggested uh, as a Anna Summers Cox, etc., etc. And then, of course, this became a giant project which far outlasted my own tenure at the uh, Villa Favorita. But I'm actually glad to see that even today, uh, you know, 43 years later, this is still, in a way, uh, something to go by. And, and what was absolutely fantastic, and I want to stress that in view of the conversation that took place yesterday, Baron Thyssen knew that it entailed uh, that there could be new attributions, that there could be, you know, he knew, of course, that art history was something, you know, that constantly moves on. And I remember telling him in, in, in our conversation that this could happen in some instances. He said, no, it's fine. We, we, go, we, we go with it, whatever it is. And so it is, as we've heard in the case of the Russian avant-garde, for all the reasons that we know, uh, it also happened in the case of Renaissance jewelry, because uh, Renaissance jewelry in the 19th century were extremely popular and sought after, and there were some extraordinary craftsmen who managed to do some pretty impressive kind of pastiche uh, uh, imitations of Renaissance jewelry. And so also the outcome was that few, and very, very few only, of these pieces were no longer viewed as Renaissance jewels, but became 19th century. So um, that, that was the extraordinary thing. Now, he, uh, that was the beginning of him starting to lend his collection and, and going on traveling tours. So he did, a multiplicity of exhibitions in the United States in particular. There was a lady called Anne-Marie Pope, uh, who was, I think she must have been in her mid-80s when she started. I mean, she was extraordinary. Uh, and she loved, I can't remember, it was vodka tonic or, or gin and tonic, but she was literally n eating no food, but she was purely uh, um, kind of <laughs> going from one vodka tonic to the next. And uh, this made her very, very focused and, and, and good. And so her specialty was to, speci to organize an exhibition, clé en main, I, I mean, uh, I, organizing the curator, organizing the selection, etc. And then she would go and offer it to various American museums. And so all these mu museums were delighted that they were going to get part of the Thyssen collection on tour. Not only were they going to get part of the Thyssen collection, but they were going to get Baron Thyssen himself, who would come for the open. And so my privilege was that I was traveling nonstop. I was accompanying him on all of these trips. And every place he arrived, he was received like a head of state. I mean, it was fantastic. And they were, <laughs> were getting off the plane, they were all the press and all that. It was, it, it, he really was a big, big star. And he 
really engaged in each place with, with the local community. He was uh, speaking to the local press. He was meek, meeting all the collectors. Uh, the wonderful thing about American collectors is they open their homes. They're so generous in making their collections accessible. And, uh, and everywhere, we had a great fun. We had great fun because Baron Tissen loved to every exhibition was a pretext to also have a good time. And my God, we did have a good time in all of these places. I mean, and so we've gone to the big museums like uh, uh, Metropolitan Museum, the National Gallery in Washington, uh, the LA County Museum, but also plenty of smaller uh, museums. We went to San Diego, we went to Omaha, Nebraska, uh, Oklahoma, I mean, Everywhere, everywhere, uh, I would like to welcome, warmly welcome, Baroness Thiessen uh, uh, here this morning. So I'm just telling how, what a magic uh, time we all had when the traveling exhibitions of the Thiessen collection started. So there were these uh, exhibitions. It was one exhibition was highlights of the old master paintings. One exhibition was highlights of the American collection. And there one has to point out again that Baron Thyssen is the only European to have focused on American art uh, going from the 19th century right up to the end of the 20th century. In Europe, American art started really with abstract expressionism. Nobody was interested in anything having happened before. You couldn't see any American art uh, having happened before anywhere in Europe, whereas uh, Baron Thyssen went in depth. Uh, he collected uh, uh, the even uh, American Western art. He, uh, it, so it was the only way to, to see American art of that period. And not only was he the only one in Europe, but he became uh, one of the most important collectors worldwide of American art of, that, of those periods. Uh, I know that Edward Hopper is being venerated uh, everywhere uh, today, but this was not the case at the time. When he bought the works by Edward Hopper, uh, Edward Hopper was part of this time that Europeans were still not really acknowledging uh, fully. Uh, and so uh, he, the fact that he bought top works by Frederick Church, by Bierstein, by Cole, by all of these artists was really very bold and unusual because I find nowadays most collectors go, there is a stereotype list of artists that you go after and then it's only, it's no longer a question of what do you have, it's just if you have good works by those people. And whereas he absolutely went for what interested him. And when he went for something, he really went into depth and then uh, it moved very, very fast in terms of the acquisitions. So um, he then also uh, showed part of his American uh, of his Western uh, 20th century collection. So by the time that all these exhibitions had taken place, he had covered the whole uh, America. <laughs> there was not one museum director we didn't know, there was not one curator we didn't know, there was not one top collector we didn't know. So uh, you can imagine for me it was a dream to just accompany him and to get to know all, all of these people. Now, uh, as I said, when I started, I was 27 years old, but uh, I tell you, when we were coming back after a trip like that, which could last 10 days or two weeks at times, I was shattered, I mean, exhausted. I was having pain in my legs everywhere. I was suffering from insomnia. I was looking gray and hazard. I had even bigger pockets under my eyes. And Baron Thyssen, not at all. You know, you could be, you could be up with him till three or four o'clock in the morning, and uh, when you, when one left at four o'clock, you said, "By God, maybe he, maybe he's, you know, a little tired, etc." But not at all. At seven o'clock, the phone would call, and he was there at the end of the phone call, and fully coherent, asking me very sharp questions, and I was trying to collect myself uh, to to <laughs> answer these questions more or less coherently. I, I thought, this is Iron Man. I don't know why, how, what he's made of, but it was just simply incredible. And there I understood what his motto was, um, uh, play hard, I mean, work hard <laughs> and play hard. So I, because he was really hard working. Uh, I, as I said earlier, when he was going through these piles, he was going through it. He was going through it rapidly, but 
He understood everything which was in all of these uh, folders. He had read everything, he knew exactly. So you knew when you spoke to him that it was not superficial. And he expected the same of other people. And apparently, you know, uh, with his two sisters who were on the board of uh, some of the companies jointly, when there would be a board dossier consisting of 37 pages that would be sent to everybody, he wrote on page uh, 22, if you reach to this uh, uh, page, I will send you a crate of Krug champagne. And uh, neither of his sisters ever asked him to send him a, a crate of Krug champagne. So just to show you how in-depth uh, he was going and how always his sense of humor was prevalent. So I mentioned uh, America. Australia, we've heard yesterday, Perth that opened and even donated a work as we've heard yesterday uh, to the mu museum in Perth. I had to go to New Zealand uh, and that was the only place that Baron Thyssen was not able to come in person. And when I got off the plane, I had a, a, a TV crew and everything following me going into town because it was not because of my arrival, but it was the first time that a work by Picasso had ever been on New Zealand soil. So, <laughs> and, uh, so it was a big, big event. Japan, there were a number of exhibitions that took place in Japan. I mentioned uh, Francois Dolt. The Japanese in those days were sponsoring exhibitions and usually it was the big publications like the Yomiuri Shimbun, but also the big department stores like the Seibu department stores were financing that and making possible that you had first-rate exhibitions taking place in Tokyo. And these exhibitions were always attracting huge, huge crowds. And this, was, of course, was a case of the various uh, Thyssen ex exhibitions that did place, take place in Japan. And um, now we come to the Russian exchange. So uh, the Soviet ambassador to uh, Germany, who was based in Bonn, was introduced to Baron Thyssen by uh, the mother, I mean the Gmodzinska, I can't remember her first name, but the mother of Kristina Gmodzinska. And she uh, uh, introduced Mr. Semyonov, and Mr. Semyonov said, listen, you've sent your collection all over the place. Um, we would like you to, would you be prepared to send it to uh, Russia? Would you be prepared to the Soviet Union? And uh, Baron Thyssen, Thyssen said no. He, is, and, and so he said, uh, initially he said no. And so having said no, not much later, Mr. Semenov reapproached him and said to him, listen, for any painting that you are prepared to, let to the lend to the Soviet Union, we will lend you a painting in exchange. So I was sent on an advance mission with uh, uh, Francesca's younger brother, Lorne Thyssen, and the then brother-in-law uh, of Baron Thyssen, uh, Roberto Shorto, and Lorne was, I think, uh, 16 or 17, and uh, anyway, we had fairly unforgettable days <laughs> in, in Moscow, uh, but I kept thinking I, I have to, to, we have to come back intact, this team, and, and uh, so <laughs> it, was, it was quite extraordinary. And, and then there were no books, there were no catalogs, because it would have been easy to go through the catalog and say we want this and that. So we literally had a notepad, and we were walking through the Pushkin, walking through the Hermitage and making, making notes. And so when we saw the treasures of the Shukin and Morozov uh, paintings, this is extraordinary. And so we, we listed all these works. Also, we didn't have little cameras to photograph the work. So anyway, so we, we did long lists and then came back to Lugano and reported to Baron Thyssen and he said, great, great. And then he decided, let's, let's focus just on the Shukin and Morozov paintings. So we made that uh, selection and then um, the uh, uh, um, deputy director of the Hermitage Museum. Uh, he was called Mr. Suzlov, but the director uh, was Mr. Piotrovsky, and we will see afterwards on the screen the son of Mr. Piotrovsky. Between Piotrovsky, father and son, they have been at the helm of the Hermitage for nearly 100 years. So um, now, the, the, uh, in, Mr. Suzlov came and Madame Antonova. Madame Antonova is an extraordinary lady because she started her career under Lenin and she and she retired under Putin. So she uh, lived through all of that time. She was 
made of steel, but very charming, uh, brilliant. She spoke lots of languages. Uh, she also was very, very close to Sviatoslav Richter, one of the greatest uh, pianists of all time. And so at the opening of uh, one of the exhibitions in Moscow, uh, Sviatoslav Richter gave an unbelievable private concert surrounded by all the paintings. Now, as Francesca pointed out in her op opening remarks, we must not forget what time we were at. This was the height of the Cold War. So I remember when I had an appointment to go and see the Soviet ambassador in Bern, Switzerland, and I asked the taxi driver to drive me to the so uh, emb embassy. During the whole drive there, I could see his piercing eyes looking at me in the rear mirror and saying, I'm Swiss, and so he was thinking this is a traitor. <laughs> <laughs> looking, uh, saying, anyway, so um, it was a very, very bold uh, gesture of Barentissen to agree to do this change, to ex exchange, because uh, again, you have to put yourself into wh what the general mood was back then. And so m m uh, the Russian side was able to choose their list, their dream list, after having been in Lugano. And then we all sat down uh, around a table with Baron Thiessen uh, uh, and the directors around the table. And it then it was eye for eye, tooth for tooth, <laughs> and started this uh, negotiation, which did lead to two selections having been agreed on either side. And even after the deal was done, everybody said, you are mad, you are crazy. They will never send you the originals. Watch it, you will never see the originals. And I believed some of these people, and I must say, uh, my first huge sigh of relief is when the first crates arrived in Lugano, and we opened these crates, and then came out these phenomenal masterworks. The best Gauguin's, the best uh, Van Gogh's, the best Picasso's, the best Matisse, the best Cezanne's. It was just unheard of, it was incredible. Now, uh, how do we exhibit these works in the private home? Uh, and because the gallery was built, as we've heard yesterday, for the old masters, so, and the private home was a private home, and Baron Thyssen said, no, no, that's fine, we make space, we, we just free the whole first floor, and we just put all the Shukin and Morozov treasures up there. So the uh, private part of the villa was arranged, and you have to, again, to understand the significance of that, uh, realize that uh, this was in the days of Leonid Brezhnev uh, being uh, Secretary General of the Communist Party. So uh, this was long before the Perestroika, Glasnost, and, 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 and all of that. And for the Soviet Union to send masterworks which they had never ever sent outside of the Soviet Union, and that the first time they would leave the Soviet Union would be in the private home of the, the, one of the best known capitalists was quite, <laughs> quite something. So uh, the, it all happened. And then, the, as I said to you earlier, Baron Thyssen loved having fun, and every opening was a uh, pretext to do a phenomenal party. So the first opening, when the, uh, these treasures of uh, Shukin Morozov arrived, the Villa Favorita, uh, 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 Tita and Heine invited all their best friends who all flew in from all over the place. So there was Henry Ford <laughs> the second, there was uh, Anne Getty, there, there were Alfred Taubman, they were all, and, and also from London, they all uh, flew in. And at the same time, there were all these Soviet officials uh, <laughs> uh, from the Ministry of Culture, uh, from, from the embassy, etc. And uh, initially one thought, you know, I wonder how it's going to be work, this, this mix, this is an unusual mix of, of guests. Well, it was the most electric, uh, most amazing event. We all drank so, so much, me included, that I, you know, at the end of the night, it's it, it, it very difficult to remember everything vividly. But however, however, I remember seeing uh, Anne Getty dancing phonetically with a Soviet official, another Soviet official, <laughs> <laughs> dancing with Judy Taubman, etc. I mean, it was, and they all felt they were in seventh heaven. And 
there was such a euphoria that at some stage Baron Thyssen got up. There were, of course, plenty of toasts, but the one uh, single toast that I remember most vividly, uh, where Baron Thyssen got up and said, listen, this is such a pleasure to do all of this together uh, uh, with, uh, with uh, uh, the, all the representatives of the Soviet Union. Let me tell you solemnly one thing. If the Berlin Wall comes down, I will give all my collection to the Soviet Union. Now, now the, as I told you, we all had drunk quite a bit, and this included, of course, all the Soviet officials as well, and it was, of course, unthinkable in those days that the Berlin Wall would ever, ever, ever come down. I mean, it was something that you could not even, even the thought was already something incredible. And so, when it did eventually happen, uh, all the people who had been there were so drunk that none of them rem remembered it. <laughs> and luckily for Spain, nobody ever uh, reminded, <laughs> reminded Baron Thyssen of his, of his uh, uh, toast done during that night. So now, that exhibition, still to this day, and it was after all in 1983, is the most successful exhibition that ever took place in Switzerland. There were 420,000 visitors who came to see it again, in a building that was not equipped to handle so many people. So, um, and one thing which was fascinating, the very three, four first days, the people were queuing inside the garden. And th there was already quite a good uh, visitor stream, but we felt, no, we must move the queue from inside the garden to outside the main gate, because otherwise people who drive past don't see it. So the minute we moved the queue outside, the queue became longer and longer and longer, and everybody driving past thought, oh my God, what's going on? And it really became exponential. People had to wait <laughs> up to six hours in a row, and um, once the, the gatekeeper, uh, 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 gate man, uh, uh, recognized the lady, and, and he, he called me up and he said, uh, I think she looks like uh, Madame Picasso, it was Jacqueline Picasso, and so uh, I, I went and I, I, I offered, I said, listen, why don't you go past? She, she did not want, she did wanted to follow things. She did not want a VIP treatment. She just wanted to follow uh, like all the other, other people who, ha who had visited it. I could go on and on with crazy anecdotes where, where the visit of uh, David Hockney and, 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 and so on and so on, but we would be here all night long. But um, the, the, uh, the success was unprecedented, and you cannot imagine the coverage it got in the global press. I mean, it was uh, non-stop. And this gave, really, Baron Thyssen a, a, a status uh, of a head of state because it was, and I, that really what struck to me most is that the cultural legacy is more important than any legacy you can leave. Uh, however successful you are in how, whatever field you are, it's in the most long-lasting legacy is what you achieve in the cultural arena. And it's not because of his successes as a businessman or of the importance of his group uh, that he was received everywhere with open arms. It was because of his collection. His collection uh, that he was prepared to share so freely with the public at large, which opened all the doors. So then uh, further exchanges took place. There was, it was equally successful in the Soviet Union. So uh, they broke all records of people seeing the Thyssen treasures, so they wanted also uh, part two. So part two, Dick Plankford, it had part three and part four. So four exchanges took place. Wha the second one was again um, impressionists against old masters. The third one was uh, pioneers of the uh, avant-garde against pioneers of the avant-garde. And the third one was gold and silver against gold and silver from the Kremlin and from the uh, Hermitage. And then, uh, I, Baron Thyssen really en enjoyed it and felt, well, well, after all, we can do exhibitions, we can do other exhibitions. Also, it was very, very lucrative because uh, the catalogs were selling like hotcakes. We opened a little cafeteria in the garage. Everybody was uh, uh, going to the cafeteria. Uh, this was the days of postcards, not of, of, of selfies yet. So, but uh, everybody wrote their postcards from the gallery, sending it to the world at large. And, uh, 
there were some people who didn't want to buy the catalog, so we did a little printed out list of the works, which was literally put together with a stapler, and we, I think we were selling that list for one franc. Well, just that little list <laughs> made also quite a lot of money. I mean, despite the costs of insurance, everything, it was a lucrative um, uh, exchange. Now, uh, the Russians, after having had a triumphant exhibition in uh, uh, Moscow, Leningrad, as it was called, and Kiev, which was part of the Soviet Union, uh, they, they, uh, then, then the National Gallery came, Carter Brown, and said, listen, we want uh, a show as well. And um, so Baron Thiessen also, and that shows how generous he was, he said, okay, um, I'm going to help you. And in order to help you, uh, I, I, I am prepared to sell it, to send it to another destination. And so the Russians said it would be our dream to have this show in Novosibirsk. And so <laughs> we, we all went to Novosibirsk. And let me tell you, yeah, Novosibirsk is real fun when you go there with Baron and Baron Thyssen because, wow, it was, it was absolutely extraordinary. We went in the summer, I hasten to add. But um, there is a small museum, or was a small museum in those days in Novosibirsk, and they uh, had this show, and of course, uh, hundreds and thousands of people saw it also in Novosibirsk, and they celebrated uh, basically the generosity of Baron Thyssen, uh, which allowed them to see such first-rate paintings. What was interesting then, when the preface had to be written for the Washington catalog, there were plenty of people who, trying to take the credit for it. I had sent my, the draft preface, and then I saw that they had crossed out <laughs> <laughs> Half of it that said and, and ch changed uh, Armand Hammer's and put his name in. So there was uh, Armand Hammer hated to see that uh, Baron Thyssen was the one who was obtaining all these things. And so, anyway, th th these are all details, but uh, it was uh, fascinating to see. So then we did an exchange with the Budapest, and which was also great because it showed some wonderful works that also had not been seen at the time you know, on, on this side of the uh, Iron Curtain. And um, then we did, uh, thanks to the uh, fact that Baroness Thyssen by that time uh, had uh, started playing a significant role and had married during that time, B Baron Thyssen, uh, they did the ultimate Goya exhibition. It was a, a, a and m most of the works that came uh, were from Spanish private collections and had not ever been seen outside of Spain. So it was also a total sensation, that exhibition. And like with everything else, the opening party lasted, I think, 48 hours <laughs> nonstop. They were f uh, flamenco bands that had to relay each other's uh, dancers and, and, and musicians. We went on the little boat on the lake and the music was continuing and uh, um, it was really a test on your stamina, but Spaniards don't need a test on their stamina. They have, that's part of their DNA. So it was phenomenal. And I know that there is now, uh, I have a friend who yesterday went to the Prado and she told me, but there are no Goyas. And I said, well, there's a good reason for it. Uh, there is a big Goya exhibition in, uh, at the Fondation Bayeler in Basel. So, uh, but I'm very proud, but nobody was around in those days. But all of this has happened long before, thanks to Baron <laughs> So the same way that the biggest success in Paris ever was the Shukin and Morozov treasures at the Fondation Vuitton. Louis Vuitton, all this happened uh, at Baron Thyssen many, many years back. Then, in those days, there were the question of who had more imperial eggs by Fabergé. So, the Kremlin museums had one number, but Malcolm Forbes, a great friend of Baron Thyssen, had one egg more. So, uh, <laughs> there was this big competition. So, Baron Thyssen thought, oh, it would be fun to show the collection of uh, <laughs> Malcolm Forbes. So we, we uh, discussed that collection uh, the, uh, to do an exhibition in Lugano. It was all agreed. And then I had heard that Malcolm Forbes was obsessed with balloons, and he had just recently bought a Fabergé egg, um, and I thought maybe we could ask 
uh, to do a balloon in the sh shape of the latest Fabergé egg, and uh, Baron Thiessen and uh, Malcolm Forbes can climb in the balloon at the opening. So we did, we did have, uh, I started looking into what it is to have a balloon made, etc. and I didn't realize that the idea was a, a costly idea, and so, uh, uh, that was one moment when, when Baron Thiessen saw the costing, instead of the little OK, came back a no. So I called um, Kip Forbes, the, the son of Malcolm Forbes, with whom I was in touch, and I said, listen, I have, uh, sorry to tell you, uh, we're all on, it's going to be the best exhibition ever, ever, ever. However, the balloon, I think we must forget the balloon. And then he comes back and he said, I've spoken to my father, the message is simple, no balloon, no exhibition. So I said, oh my God, why did I come with this ridiculous idea? Anyhow, so the, the balloon was, <laughs> was made, and um, now we did not want to take the risk, of course, of Baron Thyssen and uh, uh, Malcolm Forbes to disappear with that balloon. So, uh, we, so you had the balloon uh, on the Gardens of Villa Ferrita, and we had an army of strong, strong men who, who let them climb up, and, but they're all holding it at a string, and so he saw them going up and all that. And I must say, from the... PR point of view for the exhibition, the front page of all the Swiss newspapers the next day showed the balloon with Malcolm Forbes and Baron Thyssen in it. And so, um, but just to show the sense of fun that Baron Thyssen had, because every one of these openings, there was something incredible happening. So when he did an exhibition of his American uh, paintings in Lugano, he suddenly asked, he said, um, because when we had been in Oklahoma, we had a lot of fun with a square band, you know, the square, square dancing. That's the dance that the cowboys and cowgirls do. And he said, uh, can you please get me a square dance band? And so I was inquiring everywhere, where do you get a square dance band? And finally, uh, uh, somebody had the idea to, tell me, to say I should get in touch with the US Army base in um, Heidelberg. And indeed, they did have a square dance band, and so the US Army base <laughs> sent their square dance band. And so uh, everybody was dressed up in, in, in cowboys, cowgirls, and uh, uh, I mean, this is politically incorrect to say, but also in, in, in Indians. And it was, we really thought we were in the middle of a Western, and uh, there was this amazing country and Western music, and all, everybody danced deep into the night. So I think it's this joy of life, this joy of uh, uh, living in the moment of what he was doing, which was so magic uh, with Baron Thiessen, which was so magic for anybody who had the privilege of coming near him. Uh, the, you know, my problem is I ramble on. I, when 45 minutes is up, you please raise your arm. I'm probably I'm way, way above it. Uh, I would like to just uh, just finish on the cultural diplomacy thing. Baron Thiessen was lending parts of his paintings to a program called uh, Art in Embassies program. So uh, there were paintings of his everywhere, at the US Embassy in Madrid, at the US Embassy in Brussels, uh, at the Federal Reserve Board in Washington, D.C. I remember when we went with Tita and Heine, we went to the Federal Reserve Board. This was before Alan Greenspan, it was Paul Volcker, who is, the, uh, who is a legendary figure, and and he showed us around all the offices of the Federal Reserve Board, and we ended up in his own office. And above his desk was the beautiful Goncharova that is hanging right here uh, at the Thyssen Bornemisza Museum. And um, so when I was doing the inventories, I loved it because I had to travel to all of these places. So I was going to Bremen, to Hamburg, to literally there was hardly a place where there were no, uh, no paintings of the collection. So he really was sharing them uh, in, in a big way. So when the uh, summit between Gorbachev and uh, Reagan, the second summit, the first summit took place in Reykjavik, but the second summit pl took place in um, Geneva, uh, Baron Thiessen lent his paintings for, so that the meeting could take place uh, in front of 
wonderful paintings from the Thyssen collection. So it was pa paintings from the American collection, and uh, the, the was very fruitful talks, <laughs> thanks to the great art that was on the walls. It always shows that you need to have the right environment to be fully um, inspired. Uh, we were received by Madame Gorbachev, then also in Russia, and I had the privilege when I left uh, uh, the, the seven magic years of working for Baron Thyssen, and I joined Sotheby's as head of uh, 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 Europe, uh, I uh, initially, uh, Baron Thyssen said, one, one day a week you, you stay at my disposal. So uh, he did a trip with uh, Baron Thyssen to Moscow, so I was no longer uh, working for him uh, full time. And we had, of course, a magic time in Moscow, like always. And then we went back to the airport, and uh, Tita and Heine had a lunch in Madrid. And then suddenly I look everywhere for my passport. And uh, in those days, there were these babushkas in the hotel who confiscate your passport the minute you get into the hotel. So I had been too distracted forgotten to ask for my passport back. So Heine said, listen, I'm sorry, I, I, I can't skip my lunch in Madrid. So uh, I, I, a, a, an official from the Ministry of Culture very kindly offered me to drive me back to go and get my passport and to organize a commercial flight and then go all the way back to the airport. So I spent five, five hours with this official from the cultural ministry. And I always say th the best things in life are accidental. It's, it's never when you want, to, in, at least in my case, when I want something, it's the best way to make sure it doesn't happen. But the good things always happen when you are relaxed and suddenly they do happen. So um, it was a blessing that I lost this passport because suddenly I thought, why doesn't Sotheby's do an auction in, um, in Moscow? And I thought they would tell me this is the most ridiculous idea we've ever heard. But um, to my great, great surprise, they, they listened to it, et cetera, et cetera. And eventually I had a much tougher time convincing Sotheby's to do it than convincing the Soviet Ministry of Culture. So in 1988, this auction took place in Moscow. Sorry, this is no longer directly Thyssen, but it is thanks to Thyssen. That's why I'm mentioning it, and it is a result of cultural diplomacy. That auction took place. At the time, Russians had no money, they, so they, the room was packed with 3,000 people, uh, uh, mostly Russians, but collectors from America and Europe had flown in, and the auction was a total triumph. I mean, it was uh, prices way beyond anything that had been expected. One third of the auction were Russian avant-garde paintings that had been donated by the descendants of the Rochenko, Stepanova, etc. donated those works. Those also sold incredibly well. The other works was from unofficial artists, and at the time there was the official union uh, for the artists, and that auction was a game changer, because for after that auction, artists who had not been allowed to travel, who, n who could not have studios, could not have the materi material literally to paint, suddenly they could start traveling, suddenly it opened up. And so the careers of Kabakov, Bulatov, Vasiliev, uh, many, many more, that really was a point of departure in, in, in a way. So it was a pivotal point. So uh, to cut a long story short, um, I think it, it's a joyful moment to be able to share these moments about Baron Thyssen. We had, uh, for me, it really was like a school reunion. It was so nice yesterday uh, to, meet with uh, um, friends that I had not seen for many years and to, yes, reminisce about uh, these moments and ab about the extraordinary personality of Baron Thyssen, which made all of this happen. Now, I'm not somebody who likes to look back. I love to look forward. And I find that the Thyssen Bonamisa Museum has glorious days ahead of it. When I see what you have all been doing here, it's stunning. It's very, very, very impressive. And again, I end up, I think that Baron Thyssen would be extremely proud and happy of seeing what is happening right here in this building. Thank you so much.
Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Simon. Uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to have you here. And I would like to ask uh, if uh, there is any question for, for him, or we can pass to the next speaker. I don't know if you... Okay, one question. Hola, muchas gracias por, por la conferencia. Eh, sé que no hay mucho tiempo, pero me, me encantaría que contase... Ah, okay, you don't have headphones, sorry. I, I was wondering if you could tell us uh, any anecdotes about uh, the Baron's relationship with other living artists, like, like uh, Lucian Freud or Hockney, who you mentioned during your talk. Uh, <laughs> Anyway, I, I would not like to monopolize the microphone because I think I, I, I have no feeling of time, but I probably went way above my allotted time. Um, you will have noticed that Baron Thyssen, the main emphasis was really on uh, artists that had already, where there was already an acknowledgement uh, of their importance on the whole. Um, But, and mostly he was not focusing very much on living artists. So uh, there were, of course, and Lucian Freud became a real friend of his and he did these uh, uh, two wonderful portraits that are in this building. Uh, but he also did a, a work based on the Vatto, which is in the collection, which is called Large Interior in Paddington, which is possibly one of Freud's grace, greatest masterpieces. And there, I think that Baron Thyssen enjoyed Uh, sitting for him because Lucian Freud was phenomenally slow, uh, so it would take endless hours. And Baron Thyssen, wherever he was, of course, people were wanting something from him, and so we approach him, and etc. And whereas when he was sitting for Lucian Freud, nobody could approach him. Could could so. And in a way, I think it was just uh, very restful. But it was really, I think, uh, a friendship between them because uh, every time that I saw Lucian Freud. Uh, Uh, later stages, always, always would speak uh, of, of Baron Thyssen very, very fondly. Um, he had met uh, Bacon, he had uh, met Hockney, um, he had met some of these artists, but again, his focus uh, was not um, on, on the contemporary art side. For instance, when, uh, when he bought the beautiful bathroom by Roy Lichtenstein, he bought it, it was Thomas Amann who had sent to me a, 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 a transparency at the time these transparencies were ectochromes were very expensive to do and uh, and so he did of course buy some of it but he it was not interested to engage in, into them so you have to see that the uh, grandfather of Baron Thyssen who had this close friendship with Rodin and then the father of Baron Thyssen uh, said art stops at the end of the 18th century then um, the Baron made the step right, right up to the end of the 20th century. And I think what is exciting is to see now how the, th this uh, museum goes very much into the 21st uh, century, the Walid Rad exhibition that takes uh, place simultaneously uh, with the Magritte exhibition, um, uh, but also what uh, the, the, his uh, children are doing, because uh, Francesca with the TB21 uh, Foundation, and which has done a number of exhibitions here, or uh, which is completely in the contemporary field, or Uh, a lawn is uh, collecting antiquities. I think the, uh, and of course, uh, uh, Baroness Thyssen, who's, who has taken the, uh, I, I always say it's a bug that is, collecting is a bug, and it's a contagious bug. <laughs> luckily, it's, luckily, it's a, a, a disease which is completely incurable. And so, no wonder that Baroness Thyssen continues to collect and has not ceased to collect uh, um, uh, since, since Baron Thyssen left us. No wonder that uh, Francesca devotes her life, basically, to not only collecting, but uh, also cultural diplomacy now in the uh, context of all the uh, environmental issues that we, we all face. And, and the other children are all uh, involved. Uh, I heard that Bocha uh, is actually quite uh, active as a collector, and I even seen uh, uh, one of the two works that you lent uh, to the museum from your collection. So, um, uh, uh, yes, okay, it's a long-winded answer, but uh, that's it, yes.